Hello, everybody. Greetings. Welcome, and thank you all so very much for coming to our session on empowering every brain. I'm Bob Strachan. I'm a professional services consultant with the AWS public sector team. And I'm delighted to introduce this session today for a very cool customer. Dr. Ned Sahin is a visionary and a renaissance man, if ever there was one. He's the founder and CEO of BrainPower. Ned's going to tell you more about himself and his company and about their journey to use AWS to advance their mission. It's a very inspiring mission to make life better for many people who experience autism and other brain-related challenges too. There are two parts to our session today. I'm going to start by giving you a whirlwind tour of the AWS machine learning landscape. I'm going to try and be fast and keep this to under 10 minutes if possible so that we can get quickly to the really interesting part, the second part, where we learn about how BrainPower has experienced actually using our services. So Amazon has been a very heavy user of machine learning for a long time, from making uh, product recommendations on the Amazon website to optimizing fulfillment center operations. And of course, most of you are probably familiar with Alexa's, um, not your language processing and voice processing capabilities. And then there's the Amazon Go store experience, where uh, we use uh, computer vision modeling technology to create a very unique shopping experience. And if you've ever got a chance to uh, visit Seattle, downtown Seattle, highly recommend you go check out the Amazon Go store. So anyway, AWS is now trying to make this legacy of machine learning accessible through cloud services. We think of our machine learning services in three key layers. The bottom layer is for the machine learning practitioners. These are the seasoned experts who are familiar with the deep learning frameworks and interfaces. We have powerful GPU-enabled compute instances that are ideal for running machine learning workloads of all sizes and types. We also provide a deep learning machine image that comes pre-installed with all the latest frameworks and uh, pre-installed and ready to go. But while all of this is great, the problem is that seasoned machine learning experts are hard come by. There's just not enough of them around yet. Machine learning is traditionally quite complicated. First, you've got to collect and prepare your training data. Then you need to select an algorithm and a framework to use. And then you need to teach the model how to make predictions by training it, which can take a lot of compute power. And then you need to tune your model so that it delivers the best possible predictions. And that's often a tedious and very complicated and manual iterative effort. And after you've developed a fully trained model, you need to deploy it onto infrastructure that will scale to run your inferences. All of this takes a lot of specialized expertise and a lot of time to experiment and optimize every part of the process. And that's why it seems out of reach for a lot of developers. And this, of course, is the setup for Amazon SageMaker. SageMaker lowers this entry barrier and reduces the complexity that keeps a lot of people from making use of machine learning technology. Starting with building your model, SageMaker uh, comes with hosted Jupyter Notebooks, which comes with a lot of tutorials and examples that can get you going very quickly, connect you to your training data, and help you pick the right frameworks to use and the right algorithms. And SageMaker comes with a, a ton of algorithms built into it already and optimized to run really fast on the platform. And once you've built your model, you can easily train it and optimize it in SageMaker. The service manages all of the underlying infrastructure for you and scales to let you train with very large data sets. SageMaker can now automatically help you tune your model. It uses its own ML models to help optimize your ML model. And finally, you can deploy your models into production on SageMaker and start running inferences on new data. SageMaker takes care of all of the infrastructure, provisioning your models onto auto-scaling compute clusters that deliver both high performance and high availability. Now, SageMaker already makes it much easier for developers to build machine learning models, but we want it to make it even easier for developers to get hands-on very quickly and experiment and discover for themselves how accessible and powerful machine learning can be. AWS DeepLens, which you can now buy on Amazon, is really a high-definition camera that comes with an onboard GPU-enabled computer that's optimized for running deep learning. And it comes with computer vision models already built in right onto the device, so you can get up and running within minutes. 
Or you can build your own customized models in SageMaker and deploy them down to your DeepLens devices right from the console. And you can program this thing to do almost anything. You can program it to open your garage door when it recognizes the license plate on your car in the driveway. Or you could get it to send you a tax alert if your dog jumps up onto the couch. Or, spoiler alert, if you're like our friends at BrainPower, you can actually use it for your mission. And Ned's going to tell you a little bit more about that later. And the last layer of our stack is the application layer. And here we have services where we've already built and deployed very sophisticated deep learning models so that you don't have to. Amazon Recognition is one such service. It can process your images or video streams and automatically identify objects and people, text and scenes and activities, as well as help detect inappropriate content. It can do facial detection and analysis as well. And you're going to hear from Ned soon about how BrainPower have been making good use of recognition. We also have a number of cool application layer services in the natural language space. Transcribe converts um, speech to text, while Poly does it the other way around, converting text back into speech. And Translate will convert text from one language to another. Comprehend can analyze text to detect language and sentiment and find insights and relationships in your text. And Amazon Lax makes it easy for developers to build conversational interfaces or chatbots. And that's my part. I think it came in under 10 minutes. I hope this flyby tour has given you a sense for some of the ways that you can use machine learning for yourselves and maybe encourage you to experiment and try to find new ways that you can leverage machine learning to do good in the world, which is the perfect segue to introduce uh, Ned here from BrainPower. BrainPower is a small company that's really very good at thinking big. Ned, Dr. Ned, over to you. Thank, Thank you. you, Bob. Oh. I'm just taking your credit. Thank you. How's that? Better. So how could artificial intelligence and machine learning tools like the ones that Bob just described from AWS be used to help us measure when people with autism or ADHD are improving in their social and communication skills? And how could these AI and ML tools be used by your company for your purposes to measure how engaged people are with your content and determine if they're happy while, while viewing it. So I've invented one mechanism for this, which I affectionately call fidgetology. And that's what we're talking about today. And let's get right into it, because there's a lot of content. So let's speed right through. Our agenda, first of all, a teaser. That just happened, so we're already on time. I'm going to do a background on your speaker, my company, and more importantly, our mission. We started with AWS to do something relatively humble and simple. I'll describe that and then describe how we started to think big and were encouraged to do so and found ways to do so. By the way, sound check, I'm hearing a little bit of echo. Good, bad? Fine. I'll talk about the fidgetology concept, and then uh, one of my team members, Run Peng, will come up and talk about how he implemented it, and how you can implement it too, very easily. Push button, don't forget that, very easy. Then I'll discuss Deep Lens, which, as Bob mentioned, came out just this week, but we've had for a while, and how we can use that in the classroom. And finally, future directions. Let's dive in. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about myself, and one of the reasons is I've had a little bit of a non-traditional career, and there's a non-traditional talk, and there's a little bit embedded here about taking a risk in an entrepreneurial way. So I've drawn it as a little bit of a cartoon, and when I did my undergrad at Williams College, I studied biology and neuroscience, and neuroscience was relatively new then, and then uh, spent some time at Oxford studying the intricacies of how people learn language and how the brain encodes that. And then I kind of doubled down. I went to my first graduate school, MIT, for a master's in brain and cognitive sciences, and there got into a little bit more of the wiring diagrams of the brain. And here's when I knew what my future would be. I was aiming for that great academic institution on a hill to be a professor, and that's what I thought the future held. So I doubled down even further, got a PhD from Harvard in psychology and neuroscience, and then I was certain of what the future held. But then I kept looking over my shoulder thinking, how can I actually help people in their daily lives, make something practical out of this science that I was learning? And as I looked through uh, postdoctoral fellowship over my shoulder in the distance was startup land. I thought, hmm, maybe there's a way to apply all this, but wasn't ready yet, so did yet more school, a fellowship at the, uh, the Hallowed Salk Institute, and that's when I saw this little rope over there. There was a business plan competition, and I thought, hmm. And I gave up a certain set of dreams. That institute on the hill vanished, and I jumped on that rope, and jumped over to startup land, past the alligators. And then I realized, oh no, I'm at the bottom of a hill. And there's a lot of milestones to go. But I wanted to also share that we've passed some of those milestones, and I'm happy to talk about any of this afterward as well. So the company, BrainPower, has been around four and a half years. And our focus is augmented reality and gamified tools for autism. And we've put together a very diverse team. Um, we have diversity of age and, and gender. We have a predominantly female engineering team averaged over the year. And uh, we have a neurodiverse team. We hire autistic team members. In fact, that cartoon in the past slide, that was drawn by one of our autistic employees. We've survived without outside funding with government grants. and even insofar as we've done clinical trials and published peer-reviewed medical papers. The point is, um, we need to be evidence-based. We've been in the press hundreds of times, we have live paying customers, and we've had partnerships even with, of course, Amazon, and a dozen awards. I'm just about to find out next week uh, if I get a finalist, if I get selected as Entrepreneur of the Year for um, New England. But why mention all this? I mean, partly it's fun, but also what's really important here is that our mission is to help other people's children. It's very important to be credible and to have achieved many, many milestones and steps that can show that what we're doing is not frivolous. What we're doing takes deeply seriously this deeply personal um, condition, autism and, and other related conditions and this mission to unlock the power of the challenged brain. These are some of the people we've uh, worked with, verbal, nonverbal, young, old, all over the autism spectrum, and each person is, is unique. With autism, families are caught between the healthcare system and the educational system. There really isn't anything. The healthcare system can't give a pill, and, and little Adrian turns around, looks at mom, and says, I love you. Um, the educational system is stretched very thin and doesn't have the trained people or the dollars in many districts to deal with some of these challenges. So we're trying to be there in a digital way where some of the institutional systems are um, struggling. And what are we helping them struggle through? Social emotional skills. I like to say that the the soft skills are the hard skills. Looking at someone and determining from an eye crinkle or a lip curl if that person is bored, happy, or angry. 
These are very difficult things. I'll talk a little bit more, although it's not the main tenor of what I'm going to be talking about today, about the apps. And the real thing that we're discussing today is how to measure if these augmented reality apps actually benefit the children. And we've done traditional measures, but today we're talking about a very new type of measure, but that can also be used not just in the clinical domain, but also possibly for many, many types of businesses. As I mentioned, we started small. We started simply. We just wanted to take our infrastructure and scale it up, make it professional grade and ready for the world through AWS. And what's the driving need? So here's where I'll explain the apps a little bit. Um, it's hard with the mic to have everything. But what we use, for the most part, is this augmented reality headset, Google Glass, and others like it. And for instance, for eye contact, mom and child or a teacher and child talk to each other, and then here's what the child would see on screen. It's gamified. Mom's face turns into a cartoon, and it's fun. And um, it's not animating. And after a while, he gets points for looking and then makes achievements for looking but not staring. We have an algorithm for that. And it also measures how much stress the person is experiencing. Once you're looking, then the goal is to understand the person's emotions. And in the screen, you see the emotions emoticon on both sides of the face and choose one by a tilt of the head. And then that is what determines whether the person is getting the point. And then mom gets feedback, gives feedback, like, yes, that's my happy face. What makes you happy? And they have a dialogue. Now, to AV in the back, so these are meant to be GIFs in the middle that should animate. And the problem is most of my content afterward also should animate in, in the same way. And these worked in the speaker room. I don't know if there's anything you can do about it. Transitions are also difficult to a new school, a new place, and we have an app that gives exposure therapy to get someone used to before an experience. All of this was on this homegrown architecture using services from multiple companies and multiple vendors, and we needed to make it scalable and a little more consistent. So when Bob showed up on site, we got to work, and Run Peng was away and just running. By the time Bob came back the second time, he had already implemented about 10 of the things that he thought we would even uh, struggle to from the beginning. And I did my part, and then we had some time to celebrate. Came up with this gleaming new infrastructure. Sorry, I don't have time to go into it. But I want to focus on a couple of things. For instance, Privacy and data security are very important to us because of the nature of the types of data we handle. And we take very seriously uh, understanding and preserving privacy. At the same time, using data as a continuous uh, experimental paradigm to better learn both how autism works and how best to uh, address with our apps, We're HIPAA compliant and so forth. So, what is this fidgetology? I'll give a background, and then Run Peng will talk about it in greater detail. Um, first of all, look at this wonderful child. It's one of the people we've worked with, first inspecting glass for the first time, and then within that se same session, uh, using it. And then we did clinical trials, both on our site and out in schools. And then I'm really hoping this one kind of works. Oh, well, this is just another thing, that we went around the country. I actually bought an RV a couple years ago and traveled around to West Virginia and Missouri and Tennessee and met people where they are and really understood the struggles of daily life. These, 
represent hundreds of children and young adults who've used the system. And sometimes parents say, oh, well, but, you know, children with autism, he's not going to allow something on his head. He's not going to be able to understand that. Well, we never had that experience, partly because it offers a completely new paradigm and experience for the child that's private that he or she can understand. Traditionally, one does certain types of clinical assessments, psychological batteries, and we've done them. We've measured whether people benefit from using our software, and we've published peer-reviewed papers. But this is what data look like in the medical world. Dry, boring tables. These are impressive to my fellow academics, but they miss something. They miss a human element. They miss something that we can quantify visually and experientially, but is hard to quantify scientifically. Ah, good. It's animating. Have a look. Can you see anything? Can you see any difference? So on the left, we have the same child, an eight-year-old, and he is talking to his mom, who's just off, just off camera. On the right, he's doing the same thing, but on the right, he's using our system to get rewards for making eye contact. It's sped up a little bit here, but um, do you see a difference? It's plain and visual that on the left, he's looking in every direction, he's moving, he's fidgeting, typical symptoms of ADHD. But how do you quantify that? So first of all, how many people here have a family member on the autism spectrum? Wow, that's a lot. How many people know someone with a family member on the autism spectrum? Wow, so that's 70% of the audience. Isn't that amazing? So what is this? I mean, if there are that many people amongst us, this is not an other. This is not a set of patients to maybe pity and maybe occasionally assist. This is our brothers and sisters. These are human beings who are part of every conversation that we should be having. And, and yet it's relatively rare for people to hire intentionally people on the spectrum. And it's relatively rare to have something that gives power and dignity to people who just happen to have a different outlook on life and a different wiring. So that's what we're trying to do, but what we're first trying to do is quantify that. Um, so I imagine some of these symptoms ring home. He's listening, but on the left, he's not only moving around, there's some systematicity to it. You'll see a procession around the body axis. You'll also see forward and backward rocking, but that's complexified by the fact that he's also spinning. And then certain motions of the hand. These are the kinds of things that we want to quantify and get a numerical score for, so that it's not a clinician saying categorically, yes, he's doing better this week. It's a number. So now I want to talk about how we implemented a certain analysis, and I'll turn that over to Run Peng, who did the implementation. Oh, your your mic probably works. Hopefully my mic works. Yep, it does. Great. All right, thank you, Ned, and thank you to Bob Strahan from AWS. All right, so how did, how did we implement fidgetology? This is the full solution in all its glory, the fully scaled architecture, and hopefully during my segment, we'll, you'll have a reasonable idea of how we got here by putting together some of AWS's newest AI and machine vision machine learning technologies, like Amazon recognition that Bob alluded to earlier, as well as Kinesis video streams, as well as some older existing services like AWS Lambda and API Gateway. So this is really a deep dive into the technologies that some of you developers, technologists in the cloud can really latch onto. All right. So the first step, of course, you have to get your, the video of your audience. In our case, that would be clinical videos of children using our augmented reality system. Um, you have to get that video streamed to the AWS cloud. And 
Not long ago, AWS released a service, Kinesis Video Streams, that um, specializes in doing just that. You're able to stream video from an Android app, um, stream the camera feed from an app install on your phone, as well as stream video from um, various compatible IoT devices like AWS DeepLens, which is also, as Ned and Bob alluded to, a deep learning machine vision camera that's connected to the cloud. And for our particular use case at BrainPower, we augmented the capability of Kinesis Video Stream to also stream video directly from um, the convenience of a browser app. Uh, uh, some of the transitions aren't working, but we'll just move ahead with this. Um, all right. All right. So the main takeaway is that with Kinesis Video Streams, you can you have the way of conveniently streaming video scalably, reliably, and in a secure manner to the AWS cloud from many, many options um, as your video source. And in our example app that we've actually open sourced and made publicly available, um, you're able to either upload a pre-recorded video of your audience. Um, or stream the webcam live from the security of a browser app. Um, so once the video is streaming to the cloud, the next step is to detect faces, detect people and their bodies in the real-time video and track their motion in real time. And the way we do this is, it couldn't be a more turnkey solution than that. We simply feed the Kinesis video stream into Amazon recognition video, which is um, basically the new AWS's deep learning tool set for tracking people, faces, objects, and images, and videos, and has recently been augmented to also work on streaming video, so that the same analysis you could do on still images and static video can now also be applied to a live streaming video. All right. And particularly useful for our use case at BrainPower is Amazon Recognition's ability to detect the position and um, bounding boxes around faces in a moving video frame, as well as give you the coordinates of facial landmarks like the eyes, nose, or mouth. And detect the facial geometries of someone's head um, in, in 3D space. So for example, in the clinical video um, videos that Ned showed us, um, you could detect whether the kid is, you know, his face directed gaze is directly towards the camera or whether his attention is focused somewhere else as he's exhibiting behaviors of fidgeting, rocking, or other stemming. And um, so all of that vast amount of data is streamed to Kinesis data streams, which triggers an AWS Lambda function that runs a motion analytics algorithm aimed at um, processing higher level body motion metrics. And for any developers in the house, um, if you try out the sample app we've made available, you'll find that it's highly customizable, not just for our use case, but we've made it so that you can adapt it to whatever your business research or development needs may be, all from the convenience of the AWS console. All right, and then the final step is to surface these processed body motion metrics back to the end user. So in our use case, th this would be um, research scientists, clinical trial coordinators, um, interested in assessing the efficacy of our wearable AR intervention. And all of this is made possible by Amazon API Gateway, which is responsible for serving those process metrics to your simple web dashboard visualization app. And it's in this layer that you would implement any additional um, post-processing 
um, filtering or summarizing of the body motion metrics. And the end result is a, a nice real-time streaming chart visualization of the body motion metrics you care about um, of the stream, streaming video. And before I turn it back over to Ned, who will elaborate a bit more on this particular use case, as well as provide some more insight into our fidgetology results, I just want to note that uh, much of the um, documentation and some useful tutorial content related to the technical segments of this um, presentation is we've made publicly accessible and open sourced on the AWS machine learning blog site that you can access at the link below the slide, brainpower.com slash AWS. And again, with an AWS account, you can have a demo version of this um, stack up and running under your own AWS account in less than 10 minutes if you follow the instructions on the blog site. So with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Ned. Just in case this one is working, is it? No? Still. OK. Thank you, Run Pang. I, you've elucidated it very clearly. And I was going to plug just what you did at the end, but I'll, I'll still do it one more time. Go to that link, and uh, on it, there's a little place to sign in. Put your name down if you're interested. We won't spam you, but we'd love to know if you're interested in any number of the reasons, for any number of the reasons that I'll discuss. And I will make active immediately after this an outward link to the blog post. And really, it's like a push of a button. You can implement this. You can have it running. You can use your own webcam, or you can upload videos. It's really cool. So what do we have here? I mean, as you see it, there we have our eight-year-old friend moving around quite a bit at the bottom. And just 10 minutes uh, before or after, we have the video above. And we're getting an ongoing score that, in this case, is related to the rotation of his face. But we care about the whole body. And with further iterations uh, from recognition video, we'll get more of the body dynamics. This is a body language and, and uh, expression of a condition. But what I'll try to stress now and a little bit later is that this is a generic kind of thing that what we're saying, the reason why these, um, these symptoms can get in a person's way is because they make it look like he's not paying attention even if he is. But flipping that on its ear, this measure, fidgetology, is a measure of how much someone is paying attention. We all know the difference between uh, I look out in the audience and if you are all texting, falling asleep, looking off aimlessly, that's different than when you're looking at me. And the uh, good thing is I've actually now invented this tool so I could find out how much you seem to be engaged. <laughs> Uh-oh. What, what are they thinking? Uh, OK, I better speed it up. Um, so you also want to make a single metric. So there's one distilled way of knowing how is the person doing, or for most of the people in the room, um, how much does the customer like or engage with our material. I like this plot also. In these two, you can see pitch, yaw, and roll over time and with lines showing the contiguity amongst data samples uh, throughout the entire session. Now, is, is that coming from this, or is it with the, hmm, I don't know what to do. Hope it's not screeching in anyone's ears. Hopefully there aren't sound sensitive autistic team members right here and, and struggling from this. I kind of struggle with that. Um, so let's try to make this a little more relevant. As we mentioned, this is something you can run very quickly. And to prove that, I decided to run it on the keynote. <laughs> so sitting in the front row, balancing a camera on my kind of elbow, annoying the person next to me, but getting the video. Just have a short segment here. And how is our, our fearless leader?
Theresa Carlson, you actually see a very low fidgeting score, especially because she's getting a little bit just from her moving back and forth on stage. Um, so she's keeping her body well posed, very dynamic, um, and just a little bit of motions with the hands, and we're seeing the fidget score. She gave a fireside chat a little bit later in the day, and then I must have really freaked her out because I was just videoing from five feet away, even when she wasn't talking, because I wanted to scientifically measure the difference between when she was talking and when she was not talking. So this is when she was talking, and you see her fidget score is still extremely low. She knows how to be on stage and how to keep the rest of the body quiet and poised but we have a little bit of residual fidget in the translational motion and the rotational motion of her head. See those, those two, you get all of these metrics. And now this is when she was not talking, when the other panel member was talking. And it's almost flat line. Her fidget score is three. Now that's someone who knows how to be on stage. Again, I must have completely freaked her out by videoing. But this is real-time data, essentially. Uh, they told me, you never know about the Wi-Fi, and I guess you know, now I kind of believe it, so we didn't do an absolutely real-time demo, but this was from yesterday afternoon. And so let's have fun, let's play it out. Here is when she was talking, and you can see all the different types of data cycling through. This is face pose and translational motion, rotational motion, going in a loop, and you're getting this real-time data on someone potentially right there on stage. There's never been anything like this. There's never been a way to measure and numerically quantify all the complex motions through space. And our body language says a lot, whether it's Parkinsonian conditions, whether it's um, you know, attention and engagement like we're talking about, or major depressive disorders, how we move, where we move, where we point, how we respond, how quickly we respond to the environment is highly clinically relevant and indicative, and there hasn't been a way to measure that before in a simple and numerical way. So how could it be relevant for you? Well, right there, I'm measuring Teresa, but really I should be measuring the audience members, right? Because she knows how to be on stage. I mean, you could use that to assess your own speaking skills and to get some numbers on how much hand waving you're doing. But you also might want to know, does the audience care? And so you could mount a camera there and get that numerical score, possibly at this conference next year, hint, hint, and get an an analyte of engagement. But you can also do it for your ads, for your apps, in your focus groups. Don't just answer a paper and pencil survey at the end. Get the data, get the real data. How much do people engage with your ads or your apps? Are your staff paying attention? Are you having a board meeting or just a meeting in which everyone's bored? Now you can actually get an answer to that. And for companies that are doing clinical trials, maybe you have an active drug or a device that might affect how much sleep people get or their general mood or behavioral health, their mental health. Even if it isn't a mental health drug, many things do affect our rhythms. And again, a numerical and clinical score. This is something we're now doing as a service so companies can come to us to rig up their clinical trials to have this new outcome measure. And if the outcome measure is as sensitive as some of the traditional ones, which are often just surveys, then you, the company could save a lot of money. That's where we're experimenting now. Corporate training. Who's done some corporate training? Lovely, right? Absolutely riveting? No. And so, is it effective? Is it boring? Which parts do people engage with? Again, we can do that kind of analysis. Building company culture, and in a classroom. You can 
probably see, right? How could this be relevant in a classroom? Well, we can get a measure of how learners learn and how teachers teach. And that's the natural segue to the next unit, which is about using deep lens in the classroom. And we've spent a lot of time in classrooms. Uh, Dr. Keshav, our director of, of research, have you been to a lot of classrooms recently? Yes, you have. Because this is the really, these are the front lines, this is the proving ground with those wonderful teachers who are out there on the front lines and trying to be everything. Trying to be teachers, trying to be parents, trying to be police people as well to monitor behavior. So we're trying to give a tool that is of benefit for the learners and the teachers in a classroom environment. So Deep Lens just came out last week, as you know. And what's so great about Deep Lens? Well, there's several features. As Bob mentioned, it is a computer. It's a Linux box. It runs in your environment, and it runs green grass, which if you know what that is, it allows it to be an edge device. So it can do the machine learning out there at the periphery, the edge of the cloud, and only send up to the cloud what's needed. That's often a cost savings, but for us it's also a privacy feature so that the analysis of a classroom can be done locally, and only the numerical distillate can go up to the cloud, which is comforting for people when you're talking about videos of their children. So just, we happen to have a few devices around the, uh, the company for a little while, and we decided to go and play. So the product, which is now a product, is called Learning Eye. And you're hearing about it here first. And the learning eye helps people learn on both sides. It's an eye in the sky, and it can monitor a classroom. So these are now going by very fast. Um, but you're seeing first the same classroom during a state where they're relatively focused, and then when something happened, and they're relatively distracted. It's going by fast, but I think you can see that there's attention being paid, and then people looking around, talking to each other. We're not trying to tell on anyone. We're trying to give people answers for why they may perform differently than others in the class or at other times. Let's say you had the big exam at the end of the year, and you got seven questions wrong. And then you looked back, and the record showed that when the material for those seven questions was covered, you were looking off into space, you were talking about the World Cup, and you hadn't been paying attention. And there you can see it in stark numbers. Wow, all right. Well, next time, I'd actually like if the system would give me a tip. As you seem to be looking off into space. Pay attention, this will be on the exam. And likewise, for a teacher, one, one lecture goes better than another, and one of them, everyone is falling asleep, and he or she gets that score. Um, you can tune not by waiting to the end of the year and getting those blue sheets that says you did a good job or you didn't, but in real time. And then let's take it further. Let's say um, the teacher has augmented reality glasses and is looking out over the classroom. It's being fed by the camera behind, but can see a false color map of the classroom that explains, oh, to the students over there, uh, might be about to have a meltdown. And that person with autism or with Down syndrome has been kind of marginalized to the corner of the class. Bring that person back in. Or Juliet just raised her hand. It's the first time she raised her hand this month or this whole semester. You should call on her. Now, a good teacher will know all this, but it's a luxury to be a good teacher, and it doesn't happen on the first day of classes. So the point very importantly, is never to replace the human being, never to replace the human-to-human -human interaction, but to augment it and to make it more powerful. So here, for instance, is what that looks like. Sorry for the little technical glitch I see. Now there's that classroom again. Now there's the learning eye overlay. The faces are identified. The circles squash and move as the person turns and looks around the class. And then the data are extracted. So in the final one, it's supposed to be that there's no video of the class. 
and it's just the circles and just the underlying numbers. So the edge device does the processing, and the only thing that's sent up to the cloud is that distillate. So there's no privacy issue in terms of the video of the classroom. And it's scalable, few, class, few cameras for a bigger classroom, and the kind of information is only gonna get better when we can detect when someone is texting, when we can detect when someone is completely detached, not paying attention, or is really in the right state to learn. So that's the learning eye. Sound cool? Anyone like it? No? Yes? All right. A little bit of nervousness. So we like to say, uh, I'll cover it here, yeah, that this is something that could make you nervous. There could be a sense of, ooh, they're watching now. That's terrible. I'm going to get a better grade on the exam. No, but it could be used like any good technology. It could be used for ill or it could be used to be very annoying. Our goal is to always empower the human actors, the teachers and the learners in the best way possible. That's why we're in the schools and we're asking them and they're saying, yes, we want this and here's the tweak that we want. Because it's an edge device, the video stays locally. It doesn't leave the school unless they want it to and the numerical pre-processed data go to the cloud. When a special needs children is o child is overloaded, we can predict and prevent that. But it's not only for them, it's for all students. It's about attention, engagement, texting, fights. You know, not all classrooms are, are perfectly calm. But it never replaces, it only empowers the teacher. And the feedback goes to both the student and the teacher. So we look at this as not big brother, but as like a, a big sister, someone who's actually looking out for you. And the devil is in the details there, but we're fully committed to making it that way. And this is for pre-order. Uh, link will be right on the slash AWS website, uh, you know, at the bottom there, brain power. So beyond schools, of course, it could be in the corporate environment. Now, I'm seeing that we have a few minutes here. I'm going to go fast through the, the kind of wrap-up, so in case there are questions. One benefit, though, is we're a budding lunch, so anyone who really is interested, please stay, and we can chat even after the official Q&A. And then anyone who's interested but has to go, please just fill out the like three-line name and, and why you're interested form on that web link. Be really, really great. And our future directions include um, outcome measures for clinical trials, job training and coaching, training for customer service, uh, early warning detection before someone escalates in a classroom, and self-harm and other mental health negative outcomes, the ability to predict and, and intervene and prevent. Quick summaries, our goal is to unlock the power of the challenged brain, AWS helped us take the necessary first steps, and then encouraged us to think big, and we tried. Fidgetology quantifies body language, and it can be used for assessing autism, and it can be used for your business to assess your content and whether people care. And the learning eye can help learning happen in a classroom in a more technologically advanced yet human way. So please, I look forward to any feedback. Thank you. And they asked me to submit, to put here that please uh, s submit the session survey, and that's particularly important for me. Um, I hope you get a chance to. And again, that link. Thank you very much.